Good morning. morning. Thank you for inviting me uh, to speak to you today. Um, My name is Mike Callahan. Um, Just a little bit of my background. Uh, I grew up in the lower mill section of uh, Dorchester. I went to Cathedral High School in the south end of Boston. I'm a graduate of Boston College uh, School of Business and Boston College Law School. Uh, So I'm licensed to practice law in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, My father was an FBI agent. Uh, That's why I became interested in law enforcement as a young boy. And I was hoping uh, to be able to get into law enforcement after uh, graduating from law school. So uh, my, uh, as you know, we know in America, dreams can come true, and uh, I was uh, able to uh, follow in my father's footsteps into law enforcement. So my first job in law enforcement was as a special agent with the United States Naval Criminal Investigative Service. They now have a TV show, but it's not because of what I did while I was there. Uh, So that's NCIS. You probably, some of you have probably seen it on TV. I don't actually watch it too much, but I know it's there. Uh, I spent about 18 months as an NCIS agent, and I worked in uh, uh, Rhode Island at the uh, Quonset Point uh, Naval Air Station, which is now no longer a naval base. I don't know if you're aware that they, they used to have a uh, a, a, a naval air station there, as well as a CB base side by side at Quonset Point, Rhode Island. Um, just for the record, NCIS uh, works uh, all uh, major uh, crimes involving military personnel on naval and Marine Corps installations across the world. Uh, so if they have a murder, a rape, a robbery, a fraud, whatever, NCIS will uh, work on the case if the case is committed by uh, military personnel. Uh, The FBI comes in on all uh, military bases in the United States if the crimes are committed by civilians, either who work as employees on the base or uh, civilians coming on the base, uh, either authorized or unauthorized. Um, In uh, October of 1969, uh, I went, uh, I transferred from NCIS uh, to the FBI. I was uh, appointed as a special agent uh, with the FBI uh, in uh, October of 1969. I went to training school in Washington, D.C. and Quantico, Virginia. And then I was assigned to uh, work as uh, an agent in the field uh, in Detroit, Michigan. And I worked on the bank robbery and fugitive squad, which in those days was a big deal for the FBI. In Detroit, in the city, uh, we had four bank robberies a day on an average. We were very busy and trying to stop the bank robberies and put the perpetrators in prison. I was transferred from uh, Detroit to Richmond, Virginia uh, in uh, 1971, late 1971. And uh, I worked there. And you might think, well, that was uh, kind of a, a great place to go after Detroit. But the crime uh, rate in Richmond, Virginia, is very high. And uh, we only had, uh, I think, in Richmond, about 25 agents, as opposed to Detroit, where we had close to 200. So we were quite busy in Richmond as well. And after two years in Richmond City, I got transferred to uh, a resident agency in Petersburg, Virginia which is about 35 miles south of Richmond. And my assignment was to work as the FBI agent assigned to the military base 
at Fort Lee, Virginia. So my role flipped. As an NCIS agent, I worked uh, uh, with the FBI. And then, uh, as an FBI agent, I worked with the Army uh, Criminal Investigation Division, which is quite similar to NCIS. So uh, the role reversal was quite interesting. After uh, three more years there, I was transferred to Phoenix, Arizona. So I got to see the western part of the United States. I was there five years. I worked uh, mostly violent crime there. Uh, but at the same time, the FBI uh, started a program where uh, they picked agents in each field office to become the chief counsel of each division of the FBI. So I became the chief counsel of the FBI office in Phoenix, and I did that for about three years before I was transferred to the FBI Academy at Quantico. And I became an instructor of law at the FBI Academy at Quantico, training uh, new FBI agents, in-service FBI agents that would come there from all over the United States, and what we call the FBI National Academy, which are superior police officers that are selected by their chiefs to go to Quantico for special training from the FBI. And they usually stay there 11 or 12 weeks. And I think they have four sessions per year, roughly 1,000 uh, higher level police officers go through the FBI Academy. So I trained several sessions of the FBI, what we call NA, in law while I was uh, stationed there. So uh, then in 1985, I was transferred back to Boston, my home. Uh, I had to step down from a supervisory role and go back to the street as a, as a street agent again to get back home. So to me, it was worth the, uh, the change. And after a couple of years in Boston, I was selected to be the chief counsel for the Boston office, which I continued to do until I retired in uh, 1999. Uh, after I retired from the FBI, I went to work as a deputy inspector general for the Massachusetts Office of the Inspector General. And I worked for the inspector general, whose name was Gregory Sullivan, who was a former state rep uh, out of Norwood before he became uh, IG. Uh, he was a great man to work for, and I ran his investigations division for the remainder of time. I was there about 12 and a half years. So when I finally retired, uh, I didn't want to stay simply, uh, you know, unengaged. So I wanted to share the knowledge I had learned over all the years uh, by writing some books. So what you have in your hand there, if you picked up one of those flyers, uh, is, uh, is basically uh, a, a little uh, representation of the two books that I've written since I officially retired. So I've stayed busy. Uh, this book here is uh, basically for police officers, and it helps them to stay alive. All right, that, that's my primary goal, is to share the information I learned in my career to help them stay alive and to do it legally. Okay, so uh, this book is a combination of law, uh, medicine, and... Uh, street tactics to keep police officers alive. That's why I wrote it. This book is called Supervisory and Municipal Liability in Law Enforcement. And this book is written for police chiefs, captains, 
lieutenants, sergeants, supervisors, managers in law enforcement. It tells them how they're vulnerable in lawsuits and how to protect themselves. So uh, if you have an interest in either of these topics, I would recommend my books. <laughs> I don't get much money on them, believe me. I'm not, I'm not here to sell uh, books, but I thought you might find it interesting. Yes? Are they both applicable? Um, in a certain sense, uh, uh, this one is. In other words, if, if you are, uh, if you are a, a, a concealed weapons carrier, then you might find some of the things in this book interesting that I guarantee you didn't know. OK? All right. So having given you that introduction, I want to get right into uh, my topic today, which is uh, basically um, what really happens in these shootings uh, that you read about. And, and by the way, they can happen in any city or town. You might think, well, most of them happen in Boston, big city. Yes, but we, the, the two most recent shootings that we've had in this area where police officers have been killed, one happened on the Cape in Yarmouth. The other happened in a, a town not too far away from here in Weymouth. Okay, and I might go into a little bit about those as I get into this. So they can happen anywhere, on any day, at any time, with no warning. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, is uh, go through some statistics that you probably don't know about. When you see LEOCA up there, that stands for Law Enforcement Officers Killed and Assaulted. LEOCA, OK? I'll refer to that more than once today. So the latest statistics on police officer murders in America are from 2018. The 2019 statistics will come out soon. So you can see that. In 2018, 55 police officers across the United States were murdered. Four of those officers that were murdered were murdered with their own gun. One of those four was the Weymouth officer, Michael Chesna. What happened in that instance? There was a call on a Sunday morning, about 7 o'clock in the morning. Of all times, you'd expect it to be quite quiet, wouldn't you? Well, the officer got dispatched to a situation where the guy was driving erratically. He ended up crashing his car into something and fleeing the car into the neighborhood, a neighborhood like you would live in, OK? All right, so what happens? He drives through the neighborhood, and he sees this guy throwing rocks at a house, a random house. He doesn't know who the people are. So he stops his car, gets out, and he tells the guy, drop the rock. Now, there was a picture of the rock in the globe. The rock looked like a small football, OK? So the officer, uh, the guy doesn't drop the rock. So the officer walks up close to him. I don't know how close. And he says, drop the rock, and he draws his gun. So what does the guy do? He throws the rock at the officer, and he hits him in the head. The officer falls down from the force of the rock, what does the bad guy do? What happened to the officer's gun? He dropped it when he got hit in the head. 
the bad guy walks up, grabs the officer's gun, and shoots him 10 times. He still has bullets in the gun, and he runs as another officer shows up, okay? A woman living in a nearby house comes to the window because she hears this unusual noise of gunfire. And the bad guy's running by the window, and he shoots her. He killed the woman who came to the window. Now, it happened in Weymouth. It could happen in, in Wellesley. So you can see up here that 51 of the 55 officers that were murdered were killed by firearms. 37 pistols, 10 rifles, and two shotguns. Now here's what I want you to focus on. Of those 51 officers that were shot to death, only 14 of them fired back. I want you to think about why that happened. I'm going to tell you as we go along today, OK? In 2018, 43 of the officers murdered were wearing body armor. If you add it up, that means the 12 weren't wearing body armor. So what's the lesson there for police officers? Please wear your body armor. In the last 30 years, over 3,000 police officers' lives have been saved. Why? Because they wore body armor. So if you don't wear your body armor, as you go out on the street, you're asking to be killed. It's common sense, isn't it? OK, let's go down to the, to the last bullet. In 2018, 24% of the officers murdered were murdered by long weapons, not handguns, but rifles or shotguns, OK? So 24%, all right? In the 10-year period, 2009 to 2018, 471 officers were murdered by firearms in America. Yes. Probably, mm -hmm. I'm guessing, most of them do not have legal possession. OK? But I don't know for sure. Some of them probably did have legal possession, but most don't. All right. Of the 471 officers that were murdered by firearms in that 10-year period, 131 of those officers were killed with long weapons. OK? That comes out to about 28%. So here's my point. If close to 28% of the officers are murdered by long weapons, shouldn't the police officers that have to engage them have long weapons in their vehicles? Don't send me to a gunfight with a knife. Don't send me to a, a, a rifle fight with a pistol. I'm going to show you the difference between the rifle and the pistol in a second, OK? It's a magnificently huge difference. Police officers should not have to go and fight a person with a rifle without a rifle. If we send them out like that, we're asking for their death. 25% or more of the officers murdered 
every year are murdered by a long weapon. And when you get the call, you don't know what weapon the person has. And some people might say, well, the SWAT team will take care of that. The SWAT team will never get there. It's the first officer on the scene that's going to confront the rifleman. The SWAT team has to assemble. By the time they assemble and get there, the shoot is mostly over. So if you hear this debate in your town, I don't know what Wellesley does, but if you hear a debate that about, oh, we shouldn't have long weapons in the police cars because uh, it looks too militaristic, help save the life of your police officer. The gun isn't going to come out unless it's needed. Your officer isn't going to stop you with a long rifle. because you went through a stop sign. I'll just give you a little example of why police started putting long rifles in their vehicles. There are several, there are several horrific incidents of rifle murders, OK? But one of the most uh, significant and well-known, if you go home today and put uh, the North Hollywood bank robbery shootout into your uh, Google, you'll get all sorts of videos of what I'm going to just talk about right now. And you can see, in reality, what I'm going to tell you. The North Hollywood bank was robbed by two guys wearing full military-grade body armor. That doesn't mean uh, soft Kevlar body armor like the police wear normally. It means steel plates, not only on their chest, but on their back and down their legs, front and back. They're ready for Afghanistan and more, OK? So they go into the bank, and the best laid plans of mice and men off go astray. So what happens is a patrol car is riding by the Bank of North Hollywood, the Bank of America, and just happens to see these guys in their uh, black hoods, their totally black outfits, carrying long guns going into the bank. That's not a normal thing to see. So they call for backup and say the bank robbery is uh, in progress. So the LAPD sets up a perimeter around the bank waiting for these guys to come out. So when they came for that robbery, this is what they had with them, OK? They had one AR-15 rifle converted to fully automatic. That means pull the trigger, and you can fire as many rounds as, as are in the magazine of the weapon. The magazine, some people call it a clip. I would tell the officers, you don't call it a clip. You call it a magazine, all right? Uh, they had three AK-47 rifles converted to fully automatic. They had one 308 hunting rifle that used to kill bears in the woods. And then they had handguns. Other than that, they were very nonviolent. <laughs> so when they came out of the bank, oh, by the way, what did the police officers have? They had 9 millimeter pistols, their standard issue pistol. So these guys uh, had 100-round magazines. You know, most AR-15 rifles will have 30-round magazines. 
These guys have this the drum with a hundred bullets in it that they can fire fully automatic. Does that put the officer at a big disadvantage? That. They had, thir they came to the bank with 3,300 armor-piercing bullets. That means that even if an officer is wearing a steel plate like the SWAT team does, the bullet will go right through it. The firefight that happened here in North Hollywood lasted 44 minutes. Most police shootings are over in one, two, three seconds. 44 minutes. So those LAPD officers were suddenly in a fight with the Taliban. All right? You just take those guys and put them over in Afghanistan and that's what they were, they were fighting people that were probably better prepared than the Taliban. So during the 44 minutes, the bad guys fired, get this, 1,000 bullets at the police. 1,000. The police fired 750 rounds back at them. They hit them several times with handgun rounds. Guess what happened? Nothing. The bullets bounced off the armor. The handgun bullets will not go through the steel plates. So at the end of the battle, one of the guys whose rifle malfunctioned committed suicide. He died by his own hand. The other guy was killed by a SWAT team, which, by the way, didn't arrive until about the 20-minute mark of the battle. You get my point about whether the, rif the rifles are needed by the officers that first respond? Now, amazingly, amazingly, seven officers were shot during this firefight, none died. It was like a miracle from heaven. Ten civilians were shot. You know, people are riding by in the street, whoa, what's going on here? Boom. Next thing you know, you're shot. None of the civilians died. And the other, the other uh, bank robber, was killed at the end of the 44 minutes by a SWAT officer. Now, this guy is down behind a car with his AK-47 firing away at the SWAT guys. All right, so he's kneeling down. So what happens is his, his abdomen area is exposed underneath the car. So the SWAT officer lays down on the ground and shoots under the car. And that's how he got him. I want to just talk about one more incident. Sikh, Sikh Temple, Oak Creek, Wisconsin, August 5th of 2012. It's a Sunday morning. A guy shows up at the temple with a 9mm pistol. He goes into the temple, and he starts to systematically kill the people inside. So he kills six of the Sikh people inside and wounds four more. Then he decides to go back outside. I don't know why. Maybe he needed more bullets. <laughs> I really don't know. But when he went back outside, the first police officer responding to 911 shows up gets out of his car, sees the bad guy with the gun, draws his pistol, they both shoot at each other. The police officer missed, but the bad guy shot the officer in the throat. The officer fell down, 
And the bad guy came up to him and shot him 14 more times. But he didn't die. Now, three of those bullets went into what? His body armor. So the body armor saved that officer's life because in law enforcement terms, we call three shots to the chest K-5 shots. That means that they're non-survivable. If you look at law enforcement targets, you're going to see a box. They have a silhouette target of a human. In the middle of that uh, silhouette is a box. That's K-5. Those are, those are uh, non-survivable wounds in most instances. So three of those rounds hit the bulletproof vest, and that's why Lieutenant Brian Murphy, look him up. You can, you can see him talk about this shooting on the Internet by Googling Lieutenant Brian Murphy, Oak Creek, Wisconsin, shooting. Now, while the bad guy's standing over him, a second officer arrives. He doesn't know what's going on, but he sees this guy over a uniformed officer. He pulls out his which gun? No. He had a AR-15 long rifle. So from 60 yards away, 60 yards away, he fires one shot at the bad guy. He hits him in the hip, all right? Hits him in the hip, and that's a non-survivable wound in the hip. So what that bullet did, it hit the hip and went into the abdomen. The doctors later said, non-survivable wound. But it didn't kill him right away, all right? So after the officer sees him go down, he starts coming up on him, and the guy kills himself. Yeah, it has a good ending uh, for, the, uh, for the officer. Um, so why do I tell you that? Why, why would I bring that up? To point out the value of what? Of the long rifle. Would that shot have been made from 60 yards with a handgun. Unlikely, unless it's very lucky. So you see those targets up there? The one on the left is uh, shot from 21 feet with a 45 caliber pistol. See how big the holes are? The other one is shot from 50 yards with an AR-15 rifle. 50 yards. Without a magnifying scope. So on that AR-15 is what they call an EOTech red dot. It doesn't magnify the target. All it does is hone the, bull the rifle into the target. You see the red dot in the middle of the, of the chest? You pull the trigger. By the way, those are my targets. Now, which bullet is more lethal? If you just take a look at it, what do you think? You look at the size of the holes, right? These are, these are basically uh, 22 rounds fired from 50 yards. And uh, if you said 45, you were wrong. 
You were very wrong, okay? And now I'm going to tell you why. And what you're going to hear is why police officers need long weapons in their cars. High velocity rifle rounds, full metal jacket, meaning there's a copper cover to the lead of the bullet, travel at approximately, get this now, 3,250 feet per second as it leaves the weapon. Okay? 3,200 feet per second. That means as soon as you fire it, it's gone over a half a mile. Handgun rounds, 9 millimeter, 40 caliber, 45, all of those are police weapons that are carried normally every day by your officers. I don't know which, uh, which of those three Wellesley carries, but it's going to be one of those three. They travel at 900 to 1,200 feet per second, depending on the weapon. So right away, you can see that the speed of the bullet is dramatically increased by the long weapon. Semi-auto handgun rounds create a permanent linear cavity upon entry into the body. There's no cavity, no temporary cavity, and no fragmentation. So let me break that down. What, are, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about, and we're down and dirty now. This stuff is, is, is reality, OK? That's what the, the line is going to look like from a handgun round going through the body, just like that, whether it's 9 millimeter, 40 caliber, or 45. It's a straight line the size of the diameter of the bullet, unless it hits a rib or something that deflects it. OK? So your bullet path is limited to the diameter of the handgun round. There'll be no damage to the surrounding tissue that's permanent. You understand? The only damage is in the line of the bullet. I'm not saying it's a good thing to be shot, but the less damage to the tissue of the body, the better off the victim is. OK? There's no fragmentation of a handgun round. In other words, it doesn't break apart. If it, if it would break apart, would there be more damage to the body? Yeah, because the, now you have lead traveling in a different direction, OK? The rifle round, the AR-15, enters the body along a linear path, like the handgun round, all right? And it travels in a linear path for about four and a half inches, all right? So it's going to go in straight until about four and a half inches. Then what is it going, what's going to happen to it? It's going to turn. They call it yaw. So now that bullet that's two-tenths of an inch in size, you saw those little holes, right? It's now going to turn on its side. How long is it? It's about an inch long. OK? So it's going in. It's starting to turn. And now it's at 90 degrees, and it's going forward an inch long. Does that mean that the permanent bullet track will be wider? It went in like that. Is the, is the permanent bullet track going to be wider? When it, logically, yes, right? So it's going to go from two-tenths of an inch to an inch. 
That means more damage to the body. Okay? That's not all. Because remember, these bullets are traveling at 3,200 feet per second at the muzzle. That speed is what causes them to turn. It hits something solid, right? And that, that impact is going to cause it to turn, all right? Now, all of that energy, that 3,200 feet per second of that bullet, has to go somewhere. Where is it going to go? All that in. Remember now, you have a permanent track, right? That's wider. The permanent track is wider because the bullet is turning. It's going to continue like that for a while. All right? But where is the energy going to go outside of that track? It's going to go to the surrounding tissue. That's called the temporary wound track. You don't have a, a, uh, a final temporary wound track with a handgun round. In the end, the tissue that's being disrupted comes back the same place it left. You understand? In other words, it's going to come back, and in the end, you're just going to have that straight line. But with the, uh, with the rifle round, now it's turning, you have a bigger permanent track, right? And now the tissue surrounding it is ruptured. It's torn apart. It's ripped. All right? And that's what's happening. So that little bullet that you saw up on my target, that little hole, if it kept going that way, it would just be a little hole all the way through, right? Now. Your little hole looks like this. You got it? All this tissue on both sides is ripped and torn apart. So what happens if that rifle round goes into the body, into my leg here? You know you have an artery that goes down your leg, right? So the bullet goes in, and it's... Uh, it's two inches away from the artery. Are you safe? You would have been if it's a handgun round, right? Because there's going to be no damage to the surrounding tissue. But with the rifle round, that artery is going to be ripped apart, even though the bullet never hit it. You see why police shouldn't have to go up against people with rifles, with less than a rifle? I'm going to move on here a little bit. What I'm skipping over, by the way, is a lot of stuff that the police get that I, you don't need. Okay. Plus. My, my course on this t uh, goes for six hours. So I'm trying to condense it uh, for your benefit. OK, so uh, you can see there that not all officers are killed by firearms. Some are killed by vehicles. All right? So uh, in 2016, three officers killed by a vehicle, 2017, uh, okay, well, let's see here. Three, four. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm a little confused, but in 10 years, uh, 31 officers were murdered by vehicles in America. If you add 2019, which I have a preliminary figure for, it's seven more. So uh, in America, over the last 11 years, uh, 38 officers were deliberately murdered by people in vehicles. All right, so I just want you to know that your vehicle, which you get into every day, is three to 4,000 pounds. And if you wanted to be bad and use it as a weapon, it certainly can be a weapon. And we've seen these instances now where terrorists 
will go into a big crowded area of people, let's say at a fair or a festival, and ride through them like a bowling ball. All right? And we have some, uh, let's look at San Francisco, for example, where the, uh, the San Francisco Police Commission, which, by the way, is composed of all civilians, have decided that police officers cannot shoot at a moving vehicle unless someone inside the vehicle has a death-dealing weapon, not the vehicle itself, all right? So they're restricting their officers in trying to save their life. That doesn't mean that an officer should get in front of a car and say, you know, don't move. That isn't wise, is it? But if the officer is there through no fault of their own, and the person is trying to run them over, shouldn't they be allowed to shoot into the vehicle to save their own lives? To me, it's common sense. San Francisco is not the only city in America that has that policy, by the way. There are many. So, uh, what I want to do is just show you what can happen to police officers when someone uses a vehicle to deliberately harm them. Disturbing new surveillance video. Authorities in Phoenix late today revealing what they call an intentional and violent attack on three of their it. officers. You will see the car coming in from the right here, speeding toward the officers who were standing by their cruiser, smashing right into them. One of the officers sent right into the air. All three officers were hurt, two of them seriously. The driver then gets out of the car and takes aim at one of the officers. Tonight, authorities now questioning the motive and ABC's Clayton Sandell leading us off. It began in the middle of the night. Three Phoenix cops just talking next to this police SUV at a convenience mart. What happens next is what the chief calls an unprovoked attack. A man in a red car who appears to be lying in wait suddenly revs the engine and plows right into the officers. Accelerates quickly, headlights on, runs right over our police officers and into the front of the store. A sergeant, an 18-year veteran, goes down with a broken leg. Another officer dives out of the way, but a third cop goes flying eight feet high. Those are his legs in the air. He's 33 years old. It was his first day on the job. He gets propelled into that glass. He has the gumps get up, get back in the fight, and take this guy into custody. Unbelievable. The hero. But the suspect isn't giving up. Officers that were just run over now have to fight him on the ground, finally using a taser to help make the arrest. These officers could have easily been killed, and I thank God that we're not planning three funerals right now. The suspect is 44-year-old Mark Laquan Payne. The Phoenix police chief isn't saying why he believes Payne tried to run his cops down, but sees it as part of a recent nationwide pattern of attacks on officers. And David, one officer is still in the hospital, but all three are expected to be okay. As for the suspect, he's now charged with three counts of attempted murder, and police say they're still looking for a motive. So I just uh, rhetorically ask you, if an officer had time to draw his, his weapon, shouldn't he be allowed to shoot at that car before it gets to them? Okay, just real quick, I'm not going to dwell on this, but most police civilian shootings are over in three seconds or less, okay? And 81.9% of them take place between zero and 20 feet. Almost 50% of them take place between zero and five feet. So, this is about five feet. The FBI did a study of 200 shootings involving FBI agents, and uh, they determined that 75% of those shootings happen between zero and nine feet. So, they're up close, and they're personal. 
What should that mean for uh, training officers on, the, uh, on shooting their guns if all of those shootings take place so close? Should more emphasis be on shooting from seven yards and in to the target? And the answer to that is yes, because that's where all, I call it the kill zone. That's where officers get killed, between zero and 20 feet. I'm skipping some of this stuff because it's too brutal for you to see. You see the first bullet up there? That's a 10-year period. So 60 of 541 officers were murdered during routine traffic stops. OK? If you ride down Route 3 toward the Cape and you're in Kingston, You'll see a memorial along the side of Route 3. Have you ever seen it? That's the Mark Charbonnier Memorial. Mark Charbonnier was a Mass State Police officer who stopped a person, I think around 10 o'clock at night, for a traffic violation. All right? What he didn't know was that this guy was a mafia hitman who had just murdered a rival mafia person up in Somerville. All right? So he stops the guy. He has no idea who he is. And, uh, he, you know, he walks up to the car, and the guy gets out with a gun and kills him. That's the Marc Chabonnet Memorial. Next time you're riding down that way, take a look for it. It's a stone-like cross, uh, tombstone-like, with flowers and stuff around it and an American flag. So we're talking about tremendous danger with routine traffic stops. What does that mean? It means that the officer must treat the person in the vehicle with the utmost respect. But at the same time, the officer must be very cautious about how he approaches the vehicle, because he doesn't know who's in it. 99% of the time, it's one of you, you know? You just, you know, you went through on a yellow light that turned red. Oh, my God, the cop is stopping me. But the officer doesn't know who you are. So he must approach you cautiously, but with great respect. This is stuff just for officers. This, this particular incident happened in uh, Montana in 2010. This is a routine traffic stop uh, by a Montana officer. So watch it carefully, OK? How's it going tonight? Good, how are you? Good. Hey, the reason why I pulled you over, that was a turn only lane that you drove through that red light. Actually, that was a street lane. The turn only lane. Okay. Okay, I was right behind you. I know which lane you were in. 27. How much have you had to drink tonight? Plenty. Plenty? Plenty. How much? Oh, shit. Shots fired that. Shots fired, I repeat that. Suspect just crashed into a telephone pole. Anyone know how to turn this up? I know it can go up, I just don't know how to do it. You know how to turn this up so they can hear it? OK. All 
All right, so that was the, the, the driver of that car uh, violated a, uh, I, guess, I guess he didn't, uh, he shouldn't have turned. So it's a traffic violation, right? So when the officer goes up, let's say you're the driver, okay? Did you notice how he approached the driver? He went right up like this. Is that a good thing to do? Yeah, straight on. So uh, the quick answer is, no, it's not good. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what he should do. Now, you probably didn't pick this up, because first of all, you couldn't hear it. But did you see the gun come out? All right, so when that gun came out, if you were able to hear it, you would have heard a click. OK? Now, what did that click signify? <laughs> right. Well, what, what caused the noise? Yeah. He pulled the trigger on a 41 caliber revolver. That's a big handgun. And it didn't fire. The bullet that was in, you know how, how, how revolvers work? There's six bullets in a cylinder. OK, and the cylinder turns after each shot is fired. So when you pull the trigger on the first one, uh, the bullet that was supposed to go off had already been fired. All right? Shame on the bad guy, you know? He apparently had fired it somewhere else. It was a miracle for the officer. Because when that click went off, guess where the officer was? He was right here. Now, that guy's shooting up at the officer. Where's that bullet going to go? Right here. So uh, that officer should have left that scene and gone right to church. All right, got down on his knees and started to pray. Thank you, Jesus. OK? By the way, the officer fired 14 shots at the, at the car leaving, and you heard him say that it crashed into a pole. One of those 14 shots killed that driver. All the rest of them missed. The officer had a, probably a 9 millimeter pistol. Uh, they call it a semi-automatic pistol. All that means is that the difference between a revolver it has six bullets and a cylinder that turns. Each click, that cylinder turns, with a semi-automatic pistol. That means that there are bullets in the handle of the gun in what we call the magazine, OK? And there's a bullet in the chamber, all right? So when you pull the trigger on that, the hammer comes forward and sends the bullet out all right, there's a slide at the top of that gun that comes back and engages the next bullet and brings it up out of the magazine. That's how it works. It only fires one bullet at a time. All right. Now, just for contrast, I want you to take a look at this. Now, you just learned something, all right? So see how this officer reacts. Can I look around to make sure? All right, wait right there. Don't move, OK? You see where she is? She's on the passenger side. Now she comes around. Roll it down. Roll down the window. Roll down the window. Okay. 
Shots fired, shots fired. That's slow motion. Shots fired, shots fired. So, did you notice anything different with that approach than the previous one? I'm talking about the officer now. Did the officer do anything different? Well, he went to the passenger side, but when she came around, when she came around, did she do anything different than the previous officer? Correct. Correct. So, Let's say that you're in your vehicle, and you're turning that way, OK? All right, now, the previous officer came up and did this, right? So he exposed his whole body to the driver. What did this officer do? This officer came up to what they call the B pillar of the vehicle. That's that post that comes down between the front and the back seat. And stop there. All right? Why? Why does the officer stop there instead of over here? Huh? Well, there's much less of the body exposed, right? So if you ever get stopped for, you know, something minor, which I'm sure that's all it's going to be, right? And the officer comes up and stands back here. Now you're going to know why, OK? Because the officer is protecting themselves from you in case you're someone different than he or she thinks you are. Well, I mean, a lot of people would say that uh, you ought to uh, make your approach on that side and stay there, OK? And, and interact from where you are instead of going around, because now you're closer to the danger, all right? Make them. Correct, correct. And that guy had a handgun right here. All right, did you see how fast? No, it was a, it was a, it was a revolver. A revolver and an automatic, a semi-automatic, are the same until you get beyond six bullets. Okay. So, how fast was that? Did you notice? Did the if the officer was up right here, would the officer have any chance of of defending him or herself from that bullet? And the answer would be no except luck or grace, OK? So when an officer stops you for a minor traffic violation, here's what you should do. Before the officer arrives at the scene, put your hands up on the wheel so the officer can see them. Because guess what? Hidden hands are killers. If your hands are there, the officer's now going to relax a little. All right, you can see the hands. All right. And then don't move until the officer instructs you to move. OK? That way, everyone is safe. Oh, we have 10 minutes left.
I'm skipping a lot of these because they're just one thing real quick. You, you know, I was the chief counsel at the FBI, so law is important to me. I want to make sure that FBI agents and police officers do the right thing all the time. Okay? So, some people think that an officer needs to have absolute certainty before they can shoot someone. In other words, if this person is a deadly threat to me, I need to be absolutely certain. Is that what the law says? Is that what the law says? Answer, no. No. An officer, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, needs to have probable cause that the suspect poses a threat of death or serious bodily harm to him or other people. Okay? What does probable cause mean? It means more likely than not. It means probable. It doesn't require absolute certainty. So, let's put it in football terms. All right? Absolute certainty means that I have the ball. I'm Tom Brady in the Patriots. I have the ball on my 20-yard line, and I need to get where to be absolutely certain in football terms of a win. Where do I have to go with that ball? All the way to the end zone, the other end zone. Okay? That would be absolute certainty. That's seven points or six. Right? What is probable cause? More likely than not, where do I have to get the ball to? I have to get the ball over the 50-yard line. If I'm in the other team's territory, I'm in the 49-yard line. All right? That's probable cause. All right, it's more likely than not. So does the officer have to be absolutely certain that you, you're trying to kill me? No. He has to have a reasonable belief or a probable cause that the person is going to try to kill me or someone else. Okay? That's your little legal uh, training for today. I'm going to move right along because I don't have much time left. It started. Uh, you can see that the uh, why this takes uh, six hours. All right. So now I want to talk about what I call action versus reaction. All right. In in the ten year period that you see up there on the screen, five hundred and ten officers were murdered. So statistics are available for 467 of those murders. So of the 467 that were murdered that we know about, 360 of those officers did not fire their weapons at the time they were murdered. Or Come down to the second last bullet, 77% of the officers that were murdered by firearms did not return fire. So the question is, why? Would the officer have wanted to return fire, do you think? So why didn't they? And the answer is, because they never had a chance. They never had a chance. Why didn't they have a chance? Because of a concept that I refer to as the deadly reactionary gap. Another way to phrase it as you're on the wrong end of action versus reaction. OK? So this is not Afghanistan or Iraq. You know, the 
military rules of engagement might allow me as a as a uh, as an infantry man to see a Taliban and shoot him okay first but we're not in Iraq we're in America so police cannot say well I think that guy might be dangerous so I'm going to shoot him first okay so we're not allowed to take preemptive strikes in America. So where that puts the officer is at the wrong end of action versus reaction. Because action always beats reaction every time. Got me? Action always beats reaction. So reaction time, if you want to break it down, when the officer is confronted with danger, the officer goes into the reaction mode. And that mode can be broken down into three components. First, decision time. It's going to take the officer about 7 tenths of a second to one second to comprehend what's happening and formulate a response. You might say, well, that's like nothing, right? But in this game, it's everything. So remember, it's going to take, say, let's just say 7 tenths of a second it'll take to figure out what, what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, we're, we're not going to take the preemption. We can't do it. We can't do it. So you're always going to be behind the curve. Well, I don't have that. Have what? Preemption. We don't have it. I mean, why is it? I, I, just, I just mentioned it that it's not allowed. OK? So it's not generally. It's always not allowed. Second part of this is response time. So I recognize the threat. I recognize that you now have a gun, and you're going to try to kill me with it, all right? So if my gun is out, it's going to take me an additional one quarter of a second for my brain to tell my finger what to do. OK? So it's going to take me 7 tenths of a second to 1 second to understand what's happening to me. It's going to take another quarter of a second for my brain to tell my finger, if my gun is out, what I should do to defend myself. All right? It's going to take another 6 one hundredths of a second to pull the trigger. OK? So that's what we call, the, if you take them all and put them together, that's the deadly reactionary gap. That one plus, let's say, three tenths, 1.3 tenths of a second to react to the danger. OK? So I'm running out of time. Here's my point. It works the same way for the bad guy, right? If, if I can pull the trigger, let's say I have my gun out, my finger's on the trigger, and I've recognized the threat. So what's left? My brain tells my finger to pull the trigger, and I pull it. How long will that take? About 3 tenths of a second, OK? So the bad guy who's already got his gun out, he or she has made up their mind that they're going to shoot me, all right? So their decision time is already made, all right? So how long will it take the bad person to fire the first shot? They've already made their mind up now. Finger on the trigger. How long is it going to take? One quarter of a second plus six one hundredths 
equals 0.3 of a second, okay? So in three-tenths of a second, the first bullet from the bad guy will go off. Now, the studies show that every shot after that is going to happen in quarter-second intervals. Are you with me? So how many shots, if you want to add it up, how many shots can the bad guy fire at me in a little over one second? Three tenths plus 0.25 plus 0.25 and one more 0.25. How many? Four. Okay. Now where is the officer in this in this loop? He's behind the curve. Okay because he's still going through what the bad guy has already done, all right? So what happens? Before the officer can fire one shot, if the officer had their gun out and their finger up on the trigger, which often they don't, where is the officer's gun a lot of times at the start of these things? In the holster. So take that time that it takes the officer to, to uh, you know, mitigate the reactionary gap and add tenths of seconds to it, okay? Instead of the officer having his gun out and his finger on the trigger, the gun's over here. Is that going to take longer? It might take two or three seconds, right? Just, just let me finish. Two or three seconds for the officer to react. How many shots can the bad guy fire in, let's say, three seconds? Three, six, I mean, sure. Four, eight, 12, correct. How about that? That's called action versus reaction. I call it deadly reactionary gap. That's why your officer's at such a disadvantage in these shootings. Because I got my gun in my holster, I stopped you for a traffic violation, okay? And now you're trying to kill me. 77% of the officers murdered did not do what? Did not fire. Why? Deadly reactionary gap. That's why. Question? Rifle. Right. Uh, if the rifle is up, uh, the pull of the trigger would be the same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, an officer is not going to approach one of you going through a stop sign with a rifle. Okay, it's just not going to happen. I just want the officer to have it available so they don't run into the uh, North Hollywood bank robbers. Okay? Because can the North Hollywood bank robbery happen in Wellesley? Yes. You know, when I was in the FBI, we had these guys from Charlestown. They were the armored car robbers. They didn't rob many uh, armored cars in Charlestown, let me tell you. And they would kill you as soon as they look at you. One more point. People say, gee, the officer shot the person six times in the chest. Why didn't they just shoot him in the arm? All right? Well, here's why, OK? Number one, here's my arm. And here's my chest. Now, you're trying to kill me, OK? All right, so let's start with that. You're trying to kill me, all right? Is it easier for you to shoot me in the chest or the arm? Which is it? OK, so let's start with that. It's much easier to shoot a person with a bigger target, isn't it? Now, take this to the bank. If you shoot me in the arm, 
It's not going to stop me for one second unless you hit my gun hand and I drop it. All right? Other than that, it's not going to affect me at all. So you shot me in the arm. All right? Guess what? Too bad for you because I'm not now going to kill you. Okay? Because I'm not going to blink when that bullet goes into my arm. Now, what if I told you this? Why did he shoot? Why did the officer shoot six times into the chest? Well, suppose he shot once into the chest. Now, the bad guy has a gun. He's trying to kill me. All right? All right. And I fire once. I'm the cop. I fire once into the chest and I hit him into the I hit him in the heart. Is the gunfight over? Is the gunfight over? Answer big N O. All right? This is medical science now, so I talked about medicine and all of that. Law, medicine, tactics. So the truth is that a bullet that destroys the heart will still leave that person on their feet and available to continue their mayhem for another 10 to 20 seconds. OK? In other words, oxygen to the brain will continue even though the heart is gone. Now, what that means is that how many shots can you fire in 1.06 seconds? Well, at least four, all right? So in 1.06 seconds, the bad guy can fire four shots. So if they have enough oxygen in their brain to continue on their feet and do what they were trying to do before, how many shots can they fire in 10 to 20 seconds before they collapse? A lot. OK, let's put it that way. So that person who no longer has a heart is still dangerous until where are they? Flat on the ground and the gun is out of their hand. So why does an officer shoot five or six times? Because he wants to end it as quickly as possible. What about six bullets to the chest? Will that end it right away? No. No, it won't. The only way to immediately end a gunfight is to have a K5 round into the brain. 90% of the people shot in the brain die. 66% of them die right away. OK? Bullets anywhere else in the body will not be effective in eliminating the threat until what they call circulatory collapse happens, OK? That means there's been sufficient massive bleeding in the person to cause the heart to stop sending blood to the brain. That can take minutes. I'll just end with this. In the FBI Miami shootout in 1986, if you want to really see something dramatic, go home and Google it. FBI Miami shootout, 1986. There was a high-speed pursuit of two uh, armored car robbers with uh, high-powered weapons. OK? Bad guys had them. The bad guys were forced off the road and their car crashed into a tree. To the right of their car was another vehicle was parked. So you got this now? Tree, vehicle here, bad guy vehicle middle, FBI car on the right. Sandwiched in, no escape, except maybe reverse. OK? One of the bad guys, the, the guy in the passenger side front seat, during this gunfight that happened, get, he can't get out the door because the door is jammed. So he gets out 
of the driver's, of the passenger side window. Now, can he step down onto the ground? No. He's got to crawl over the hood of the car that's jamming him in. OK? So as he's crawling across the hood of that car, there's an FBI agent down about where the chief is in the back of the room. He's crawling. He takes a 9 millimeter round to the right shoulder. Now, that round goes through the right, right shoulder, and it severs the brachial artery. That's the main artery that goes down your, each of your arms. So once that happens with a severed artery, every time his heart beats, what happens? Blood comes like that, OK? The doctors later said that that bullet, which, by the way, went through the arm into his right side of his chest, across his right lung, almost to the aorta, all right? It stopped right at the aorta. Had it gone to the aorta, probably some of this mayhem would have ceased, but it, but it stopped. So is, does that mean that the fight is over for that guy? How about based on what I'm telling you? <laughs> the answer is no. No, it's not. So that guy, having received what the doctors later said was a non-survivable wound, was able to kill two FBI agents, shoot a third in the groin from, this, from me to hit you, and shoot another FBI agent in the neck. Two of those agents survived, two died. Only after that was that officer, was that bad guy killed by another FBI agent who came up to him and shot him five times. So he was still going. So when they say to you, why did the officer shoot seven times? My answer to that would be, because that's all the bullets he had. OK? So um, that's, that's all I have to say today. It was an honor to uh, be invited to speak with you. I hope that you come away with a a better appreciation for your police officers and the danger that they face, and uh, say a prayer for them every day. God bless you. Thank you.